Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Leah Rosen, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the question answer window on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question answer portion and I will ask our speaker your questions from the chat window. Your questions will only be visible to myself and our speaker. So thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Roxa Kernick from BIA Separations, part of Sertorius. Thanks a lot. Thank you everyone for joining. It's a pleasure to host you here today. Um, I would like to spend the next 15 minutes or so uh, focusing on one very important topic in the field of mRNA production, and that is how to increase the productivity of the IVT using suitable analytics that can give us information in real time uh, or near real time. And in the hope that you now see the right slides, I will go straight in for it with the assumption that I don't need to convince you of the importance of mRNA as a therapeutic modality. I would much rather spend the time talking about uh, properties of mRNA and how we can make use of those properties for analytics in, in, in the particular talk today, though we can also speak about purification um, in, in, separate, in separate webinars. One perhaps most important consideration uh, that we sometimes forget about is that mRNA is a very, very large uh, biomolecule, much larger than a traditional biologic. For example, if we take an IgG molecule uh, that is about 150,000 Daltons large uh, and was up till recently considered a large biomolecule. Well, mRNA is easily 10 times the size and the, the vaccines that a lot of the world have, have received uh, in the last year or so are, are approximately 10 times larger than typical IgG, 1.3 megadalton for an approximately 4,000 nucleotide mRNA. That's one of the key properties that we need to take uh, into account when thinking and designing our analytical strategy for, for profiling mRNA production process or the quality of mRNA. Um, and it can be seen as a challenge or as, as a benefit. And mRNA has other useful properties, such as uh, it's charged. I think that's part of the undergraduate uh, course to, to know that uh, mRNA is negatively charged due to the phosphate backbone, which, which retains its charge um, across widest range of of pHs. Um, it can be hy hydrophobic, it can be tunably hydrophobic, let's say, depending on the salt concentrations uh, that mRNA finds itself in. So we can use hydrophobicity in various ways, um, analytically or preparatively. And also, mRNA can have engineered sequence properties. One of them, a very popular one, is so-called poly-A tail, polyadenosine tail, which can be used uh, for selective binding to its uh, complementary base, which is, um, which is thymidine. So we can, we can use an AT interaction, again, for, for affinity purification or for affinity analytics, a little bit uh, similar to protein A in the world of IgG. So these are some of the physical chemical properties of mRNA that we'll be making use of uh, over the next couple of minutes. And then there are the formal, more sort of uh, biologically relevant properties, uh, sequence uh, characteristics, which are importantly that at least for mRNA, and uh, this is slightly different for other types of RNA, um, for full biological activity and stability, a so-called five prime cap is important. Uh, this is a, let's say a modified nucleotide that sits right at the beginning of the mRNA chain, um, and that sits before the coding sequence. So let's say that our mRNA codes for the spike protein. This is then the, the, the business part of mRNA molecule, and that's followed by the so-called three prime UTR uh, region followed by poly A tail that I referred to in uh, at the beginning. 
in in the production process of mRNA, which I will address in the next uh, in the next slide, both of these critical um, sequence uh, components, the five prime cap and the three prime poly A tail, can be added uh, in one pot. It can also be added uh, separately, but uh, I think most uh, applications today, most approaches of performing an IVT reaction actually do this, um, add these two components, so-called co-transcriptionally, in one, as a one-part reaction. But before we zoom in on that reaction, let's, let's have a look at the entire production workflow. Um, how do we actually make mRNA? Just more uh, a very zoomed out view. Um, typically, mRNA is made actually from another important biological molecule, which is plasmid DNA. So half of the production process of mRNA is actually dedicated to production and purification of plasmid, uh, which is produced in, in bacteria by fermentation. Uh, bacterial harvest uh, needs to be collected and, and, and cells lyse to release the plasmid. Um, and after buffer exchange, uh, plasmid can be captured by an ion exchange chromatography, linearized, purified again to remove uh, enzymes used for linearization and endotoxins, and then buffer exchange into a buffer suitable to then take into the so-called IVT, in vitro transcription reaction, on which I will spend the majority of our time together today. Once the IVT reaction is completed, we need to isolate the mRNA using a variety of techniques. Uh, traditional techniques used to be pre uh, precipitation, you can use TFF, but to get the most, uh, let's say, gentle and, and specific a selective purification, you would use um, chromatography. Uh, and after chromatography, which can be done again in affinity mode or, um, or ion exchange mode and polished by reverse phase or hydrophobic interaction, we need to buffer exchange and filter um, the material to get to the mRNA drug substance. This is the process in a slide in less than a minute, let's say. Uh, but the important consideration for us today is that mRNA is produced um, in a chemical reaction based on enzymatic conversion, that's the IVT, and then um, purified by chromatography. And what connects those two uh, aspects is the choice of chromatographic media that is suitable for mRNA. And now I go back to the very first uh, slide consideration. So what are the properties of mRNA? Well, one of the, or the first property that I mentioned is the size, and with the size come limitations. Uh, and one of the foremost limitations of large biomolecules is slow diffusion. And where slow diffusion really acts against us is in trying to apply traditional chromatographic media like porous particles, which uh, rely for the binding on diffusing into into pores, and for that mRNA is both too large to enter into the pores and too slow to actually diffuse into the pores. So we need a new concept of chromatographic media to actually uh, selectively bind and then elute mRNA. And the solution to the problem actually comes in a, in a different architecture of chromatographic media, uh, so-called monoliths, which instead of having porous particles, so beads that are highly porous on the surface, we actually have um, polymers with engineered channels, continuous cha channels that run throughout the chromatographic uh, device and there is no pores to diffuse into and the only way that, that molecules move from top to bottom of the column, if you want, uh, is by applying flow. And this actually has some quite unique properties which we, uh, which we can apply both preparatively and analytically, and I will focus today on analytical applications, um, namely because of the convective uh, mass transfer, so-called convective mass transfer, meaning that we, that we move um, the molecules with uh, literally applying the flow and don't depend on very slow diffusion, we get um, very gentle separation. There's no turbulence within the columns. Um, and we also get something that's quite unusual in, in, in chromatography, at least if we train in traditional chromatography, and that is we get flow rate independent 
um, separation. And you can imagine why that is exceedingly useful in analytics is because you can actually run your analytical methods at very, very high flow rates. These are some, um, some um, let's say, tried and tested uh, um, chromatograms comparing porous particles and monoliths on, a, uh, on, on, on what used to be one of the largest biomolecules, so IgG, to prove the point. Um, and the point is that by increasing the flow rate, a monolith doesn't, doesn't lose a capacity for binding. So no matter how quickly we load the, the column with our analyte, it does not decrease capacity. But also importantly, on the far right, um, by increasing the flow rate, the volumetric flow rate here from five column volumes up to 20 column volumes, we do not sacrifice resolution. Um, we can apply this over a range of applications. Today we're focusing on IVT. Uh, and we can apply this to a range of column chemistries to suit uh, particular applications. Um, but one of the most important ones is the production of mRNA um, that, that we can now follow at, um, at times that are relevant for the IVT reaction. So this would be, this is now getting into the core of the, of the time we have together today. And um, I would like to focus the next, few, the next few minutes and slides on IVT reaction monitoring. But given that we have the possibility, I would like to use the time to actually ask uh, you who are interested in, in IVT, in mRNA, what analytics do you currently use for monitoring the IVT reaction? Um, some possibilities are listed, I think, in your, in your um, uh, questionnaire app. And then when you monitor, if you do monitor your IVT reaction, um, are you interested also in consumption of NTPs? And uh, I'm advised to give you a little bit of time uh, to think about this and to answer, and then we can have a look at the answers together. And it might not surprise you that I would like to introduce one way of monitoring the IVT reaction um, that makes use of all of the all of the attributes that that I mentioned, meaning applying the right chromatographic tool with good separation and good binding properties for mRNA. But not only mRNA. Uh, this is a this is a chromatographic tool that can very nicely and very rapidly, for the for the reasons that I mentioned separate mRNA from plasmid DNA that's used for conversion um, into mRNA, as well as the nucleotides. Here we see GTP separated from ATP um, and CTP, as well as from the five prime capping reagents that I mentioned right at the beginning. And, the, and perhaps this is a little bit small on the slide, but the time of this, uh, of this separation is 2.8 minutes. So it's very rapid and it gets you a lot of information in this one analytical um, run. This is based on chromatography, based on, a, on an analytical monolith called TMAC Prima S, which is a mixed mode anion exchange hydrogen bonding ligand. And uh, you can imagine the many uses of this technology, uh, and I will only have time to address two today. Uh, the most obvious one being the at line monitoring of the IVT reaction, whereby we can run the reaction as in batch mode. We add a um, certain concentration of nucleotides at the beginning of the reaction, and then we monitor the consumption of nucleotides. Here, the lines falling and the mRNA increasing, which is the purple line. And that is actually um, the points on the Excel uh, chart are the integrated peak areas from the chromatogram that I show here on the right. So this was a standard um, IVT reaction that gave us a certain, certain yield over a certain time. If you answer that you use ribogreen, for example, as a monitoring method, well, you would read out one of these time points and you would hope that your reaction has reached the maximum uh, by, at the time that you selected for, for the readout. Um, doing it at line, you can actually determine the kinetics of production of mRNA as well as of the consumption 
of entities. I would like to couple this idea with another, with another um, concept, and that is if we can quantify mRNA, and if there exist selective um, enzymes, for example, nucleases that selectively degrade particular forms, particular isoforms, particular modifications of RNA, well, we can couple the two to actually determine percent modification. In this particular case, percent capping of mRNA. So we know that uh, exonucleases digest um, mRNA chains that are not 5 prime capped. And so if we, if, if we treat our mRNA that we produce in IVT reaction with, a, with an exonuclease, if it was not correctly capped, it will be degraded, and then we can calculate what's, what's left. And you can do that, for example, if you purchase some mRNA um, uh, for, for your um, whatever in, in vivo studies, you want to confirm that it's correctly capped, well, you can run this analysis. Um, I compare here three commercially available mRNAs, all capped with, with clean cap AG. And as advertised, they are uh, on average about 95% capped. Um, and if you compare this to an uncapped mRNA that uh, we produced alongside, well, that gets completely degraded under the same conditions. And you can, and the readout again is integration of the peak in, in a chromatogram. And as a last, as a last uh, idea then, coupling the monitoring of the IVT progression and monitoring the capping of the produced mRNA, we can start playing with the conditions that change the IVT reaction to increase the yield and to increase the percent of capping. And I give here an example from uh, so-called um, ARCA capped mRNA sequence. And in the first experiment, we performed the IVT as a batch process, and we had to make sure, this is from theory, that ARCA to GTP ratio uh, is 4 to 1. And this sort of reaction then inherently has low productivity because you don't put much of one of the critical uh, building blocks in. And so um, after about an hour, we get about 2 mg per mil mRNA, but this mRNA is, um, is very highly capped. This is the, the third bar from, from, from the left, 80% capping, but pretty dismal yield. We then said, well, why don't we keep adding nucleotides? Um, and how much we add, we monitor by, by the Sima Prima S, but make sure that the GTP to ARCA ratio stays approximately constant at four to one, and we drive the reaction for as long as it would go. Well, in that way, we were able to, to turn the, um, the yield from 2 milligram per milliliter to nearly 12 and not sacrifice uh, the capping. So the capping was still 80%, but the productivity was six times higher. If we ran the extremes of either, so if we just ran a, a batch process uh, without worrying about capping, the productivity was high, but the capping was low uh, or vice versa we can get high productivity and, and, uh, and low capping um, by not worrying about the right ratios between capping agents and, and, and uh, NTPs. And so in, uh, in the time that we had uh, available together today, I wanted to really, to really show just one snippet um, of one tool that can be exceedingly useful for following the IVT to be able to optimize it for a particular in a particular direction you can focus on yield you can focus on capping or you can focus on both um, if you are an experienced chromatographer that's great and you can you can you can get a column and get and apply it on a HBL system or um, there is also a system available called Pact, Patfix which comes uh, with preloaded analytical sequences and analysis tools, so you can actually do that in a more or less plug-and-play fashion, and it's available for mRNA from a BS separations part of Sertorius. And I think that brings me to the last uh, conclusion slides. So um, mRNA is actually a pretty challenging molecule to work with, but the, the, the challenges can be turned into, into benefits. Um, 
Today, I focus primarily on the analytical tool called CMAC Prima S, which can provide information on NTP capping reagent and mRNA in a single rapid assay, uh, though we could have touched many other chemistries. And uh, if any of that was interesting, I actually would like to defer you to a handbook which uh, was published on purification of plague acids, which you can directly request from us. I think hopefully we have some time for a Q&A, and I thank you for your kind attention. Thanks. Okay, great, Brock. So we... Oh, we're getting an echo. If you could mute me. Okay. So we do have the first question for you from the audience is Sema Prisma, Prisma C. We have tried to delete the CIP after mRNA PIC. How can we quantify the CIP PIC or the right concentration of mRNA? Uh, that's a, that's quite a specific question that would require perhaps a little bit of looking at the at the chromatograms, um, depending on the nature of the CIP uh, peak. We would then have to decide whether whether that's that's an isoform of the mRNA or or an impurity from the reaction. But uh, um, depending on depending on let's say auxiliary analytics, we can decide how to deal with that peak if you see it. Okay. The next question is, are the mRNA capping efficiency reported on uh, slide 14 for mRNA 1, 2, 3 from different measurements or from the same mRNA? And what is the resolution of this capping measurement? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, this was, a, this was a, a triplicate chromatographic determination of the same uh, mRNA, and we got a pretty narrow spread, um, I think, this was like a plus minus a percent or so. I don't have the, the standard deviation uh, in mind, but we we see pretty pretty reliable um, readouts um, based on the concept of en uh, enzymatic digestion of uncapped um, mRNA. Okay, and can modified NTPs also be monitored by CMAC Primus? Prima S. Yeah, so actually, uh, let's say N, N methyl uh, through the uridine, that, that, can be, um, that can be used in place of, of uh, uridine. Uh, in fact, the resolution applies to all, to all modified nucleotides that we so far looked at. Yeah, that's a good question. And can a quaternary HPLC be used for CMAC Prima S analysis? Uh, yes, so uh, at the moment the, the method as, uh, as we developed it um, uses a quaternary system um, with, a, with a CIP, CIP uh, within the method, um, but there is no limitation, for example, if, for further method optimization, if somebody wants to take it a slightly different direction, um, then there's all flexibility to take the tool, but not the method that we currently propose with it. Okay, and how pure should the standard mRNA be to generate a standard curve? Does the mRNA need to be highly purified, or is it possible to use the mRNA from a simple li uh, LICL precipitation? I would uh, I would recommend as as pure as possible. Uh, the Simon Primaris doesn't do what some other columns can do, which is resolve uh, shorter fragments. So there's a, there's a danger if there's any fragmentation that the fragmentation would be included in the, in the peak area and present itself as, as pure RNA. So my recommendation for standard curves is to use um, as highly pure material as possible, ideally sort of 90, 95% pure. And we can talk about purification uh, approaches offline if, if you're interested how to get to that standard uh, purity. Okay, and can larger mRNAs more than 10 kilobytes or kilo be used as well? I think so. I think that I think the the cut of that you mentioned there is probably uh, as high as at least I've I've seen it so far. There's no reason why it shouldn't work for for larger molecules. Still, it's worth a try. 
And can you evaluate or characterize the poly A containing mRNA versus what the poly A tail using HPLC and CMAC Primus? Primus? Primus. I would perhaps advise on a different tool for that. Uh, for example, oligo-DT would have, would have uh, selectivity for polyadenylated only, and non-polyadenylated would, would go and flow through, assuming those are the only two components of the mixture, then that would be uh, the tool that I would recommend, or, or a tool that's more based on reverse phase uh, chromatography, um, depending on the difference there that we're talking about, but it's possible to separate polyadenylated versus non-polyadenylated with reverse phase. Uh, column, so that's a so-called SDVB monolith. I'm available for more details offline if you're interested. Okay, how can we quantify the mRNA where a part of the mRNA is eluded in the CIP peak? I would, so again, I would rather look at the specific case to, to better understand it. Um, in certain cases, it's possible to get to get a, a, what's probably a more tightly binding isoform um, eluting as a CIP peak, and if that's present also in the in the standard curve, then uh, then there could be a calculation that's comparing the standard curve with the with the result in the um, in the chromatogram. But I'd rather see the the specific case. Okay, and can you? Can you suggest a method to separate capped mRNA peak from an uncapped mRNA? There we are talking about one nucleotide change in a presumably over 1,000 nucleotide uh, chain, so that's that's a challenge. Um, one way would be an affinity, uh, affinity ligand against the cap. Um, and any other way would be destructive against one form or, or the other. Okay, well, at least have been some great questions. If you still have more questions for Rock, go ahead and type them in, but I think we are just gonna do one more question for the webcast today. Um, any questions that we get after this, we'll go ahead and pass to Rock and he can follow up with you directly. So can IVT for production of mRNAs of different sizes be monitored by CMAC Prima S? Yeah, uh, so we, we touched on the on the upper limits earlier, but anything from a few hundred to, to multiple thousand um, would elute with this method in as an mRNA peak. So this is really an mRNA or RNA, I should say, um, it doesn't distinguish between mRNA or if you want self-amplifying RNA. Um, so the answer is yes, you, you, it applies to a wide range of, of sizes. Okay, great. So thanks, Rock, and thanks to our audience for joining us. The recorded version of this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website. And as a registered attendee, you'll receive an email providing with a follow-up link. Please, we look forward to having you join us at future Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcasts. Look for those announcements in your inbox. Goodbye.